It's about 9.15 p.m. just outside of the village of Orsbeek. A local man, Hubert Raj, is heading home. While driving past a block of buildings, a man comes flying out of the second floor window of a former brothel. The man lands hurt, and other men come and drag him back inside. But Raj knows better than to intervene. The building is a Hells Angels clubhouse, and he knows it. So he doesn't stop to find out what's really going on. But unbeknownst to him, the injured man is the president of the elite nomad chapter of the Hells Angels. A man who is equally feared and respected by his brothers in the club. A man who roars louder than any other member of the chapter. And Raj is one of the last people to see him alive. Two days later, the news breaks. Three bodies are discovered just outside Echt. One of them is Paul de Vries. But how does it get to this? How does an influential figure in the bike underworld like himself get murdered in cold blood? And most importantly, who killed him? Well, it's not just a roller coaster of a journey and a chain of twists and turns that lead to the moment de Vries takes his last ride. It is also a tale of a man who lived life at full throttle. A man who rises to power, only for the power to bring him back down in a blaze of infamy. In 1949, the world was tiptoeing on the edge of the atomic age. But at the same time, something less explosive but equally impactful is happening in the quaint Limburg province of the Netherlands. Amidst the post-war recovery and the humdrum of daily life, a couple celebrates the birth of their son, Paul de Vries. And in a world brimming with tensions and fears, this little boy becomes their beacon of hope and joy. De Vries' childhood, though, is as average as it gets. He isn't raised in a family of secret agents or circus performers, and the De Vries family, not exactly rolling in dough, makes their home in a modest trailer park. It's the kind of place where dreams are big, but opportunities don't come often. So the young man with his scrappy demeanor is just another kid on the block, navigating the tricky waters of adolescence. And like every teenager, he flirts with trouble just enough to keep things interesting, but never enough to get his name etched in law enforcement's Hall of Fame. In his youthful years, he moves to his own trailer, and here's where things start to rev up. Amongst his circle of new friends, there are whispers and roars of a new breed of brotherhood, an outlaw biker club. But these aren't your average bike enthusiasts who meet up for Sunday rides and picnics. The club is the real deal, with leather jackets and all. It's the kind that makes parents clutch their pearls and teens idolize in awe. De Vries, a bit of a lone wolf but with a curious streak, finds himself at a crossroads. To join or not to join, that is the question. It isn't just about hopping on a bike and riding into the sunset. This decision holds the weight of a future hanging in the balance. So does he take the leap into this world of roaring engines and brotherhood, or does he play it safe and stick to the known paths? This is where De Vries's story takes a sharp turn. But the question we have in our mind is, how does a boy from a humble Dutch trailer park rev up his life to eventually lead a chapter of an international club? This is just the beginning. De Vries has reservations about joining the Hells Angels, but it takes a little persuasion from his friends and he's all in. Besides, he has a lot of free time on his hands, which makes him an ideal prospect. And once he joins, he isn't the regular new kid on the block. De Vries is not there to just warm the bench. He's got his eyes set on the big prize, becoming president of the elite nomad chapter of the Dutch Hells Angels. But this chapter of the Hells Angels is different from the rest. It's known as one of the most notorious across Europe. It's more like the rock stars of the biker world if they were feared and revered in equal measure. Therefore, climbing the ranks of the Hells Angels isn't anything like climbing the corporate ladder. De Vries doesn't expect to just put in the hours and wait for a promotion. Instead, it's more like a mix of a gladiator fight and a political campaign where charisma meets grit. So he dives into this new world head first, and to his surprise, he's a natural. He's got this determined spirit, like a bulldozer on a mission, and he's learning the ropes faster than a Harley Davidson at full throttle. 
Becoming president, though, means more than just wearing a fancy title. It's about instilling a cocktail of fear and respect. De Vries doesn't just meet these expectations. He flies past them, earning himself a reputation that would make even the boogeyman think twice. And it's not the only thing he has to show for his efforts. He wears a filthy few patch, sparkling with diamonds. In the biker world, that's not just bling. It's a badge of honor given to those who've taken care of business for their club. And it's not the kind of business anyone wants to be on the wrong side of. As one British Hells Angel, Stephen Cunningham finds out the hard way. Cunningham is a big guy and a major player in the drug scene. He has some beef over money with his own nomad chapter, so he decides to take a trip to the Netherlands to hash it out with De Vries. It's unclear what happens, but the last anyone hears from Cunningham is a cell phone call from Belgium, and then he vanishes, never to be found. Cunningham's name stays on the missing persons list for decades, but internally everyone believes De Vries might have a hand, or two, in his disappearance. Whether it's true or just a rumor, this event further cements De Vries's status. He's not just the president, he's the kind of man who casts a long, dark shadow. But killing, allegedly, isn't his only forte. If there's something going down in the club, including major drug deals, De Vries is definitely pulling the strings. He feels like he's on top of the world, but it also leaves him living on the edge. How long can he balance it all before he falls off? As president of the elite nomad chapter of the Hells Angels, De Vries isn't just sitting back and enjoying the ride. He's steering the ship into some seriously choppy waters, into a world of drug smuggling and distribution, where danger is just part of the daily grind. And he's right in the thick of it, masterminding operations fit for a Hollywood crime drama. He masterminds the smuggling of drugs from Colombia via the Dutch West Indies into the Netherlands. It's a global tour for him, not for souvenirs, but for narcotics, mainly cocaine. It's a high stakes game and De Vries is playing to win. So he regularly sends one of his guys over to the UK to liaise with the British Hells Angels, while he himself is jetting off to Colombia and Mexico, where he aims to secure suppliers. With him at the center of this operation is Angelo Diaz, tasked with keeping the juice flowing. Diaz serves as the go-between for the Colombian cartels and the Dutch Hells Angels, and he leads the Caribbean Brothers, a Hells Angels puppet gang based in Curaçao, a smuggling hotspot. To the authorities, Diaz is officially a fisherman, but he's not just catching tuna. His boat, labeled Make My Day, is ferrying kilos of cocaine from South America to Curaçao. And these aren't just any drugs. They're coming from areas controlled by the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. But De Vries wants more drugs and more profits for his club. So in November 2002, he lands in Curaçao with plans to shake up the drug scene. Even Diaz, who's no stranger to tough guys, finds De Vries terrifying. De Vries has a bald head and muscular body covered in Hell's Angels tattoos, including those SS lightning bolt runes. He also has a full set of golden teeth, giving him an even more sinister grin. De Vries stays in Curaçao until March 2003, and during this time he's all about the business. He learns from Diaz that cocaine is way cheaper in Curaçao than in Europe, specifically going for $3,000 per kilo in Curaçao as opposed to $25,000 per kilo in Europe. In fact, Curaçao is almost like a clearance sale for illegal substances, but here's where things start to get messy. De Vries teams up with Donnie Klassen, a businessman from Maastricht who's the frontman for their drug smuggling operations. Together, they become the Bonnie and Clyde of the drug world, except with less romance and more narcotics. And in a meeting at the Music Factory Dance Club in Salina, they cut a deal with the Cartagena cartel to import 300 kilos of cocaine into Europe. The plan is to smuggle it using a generator, 
then split the profits between the cartel and the Hells Angels. And days later, they are celebrating over drinks as their cocaine-laden generator sets sail from Willemstad Harbor. But once the goods are in transit, things don't go as planned. The generator reaches Brazil but doesn't move any further, or that's just what the Colombians are told. And they start getting antsy. So the cartel sends an agent to the Netherlands, but de Vries has already sold the cocaine, pocketing all the profits. It's a case of classic double cross, and to cover his tracks, de Vries goes to extrema lengths. In May 2003, he strangles a drug dealer who could spill the beans, dismembers him, and dumps the body in the Juliana Canal. This gruesome act takes place at the home of his henchman, Serge Wagner, whose wife later recounts the chilling details. For de Vries and Wagner, it's just another day at the office. And things get even more complicated when de Vries's own chapter, Brothers, try to remind him about the Hells Angels no rip-offs policy. But he just isn't the kind of guy to be lectured on ethics. Soon enough, the chapter members start seeing him as the worst president. Unfortunately, there's nothing they can do about it. The club relies on his international connections, which keep him in power. The Colombians, furious about being cheated, demand their cut and threaten violence. Every member of the club is now a target, and it's not just about the drugs, it's about millions of dollars. So de Vries is teetering on the edge of a precipice. His actions are endangering not just his life, but the entire club's legacy. But the million dollar question is, who's going to stop him? And how? Well, this is where the story takes a turn into uncharted territory. In the early months of 2004, the Colombian threat seems like a distant memory for Paul de Vries. His world, teetering on a precarious edge, has momentarily stabilized. But the calm doesn't fool anyone. In de Vries' life, tranquility is often the precursor to a storm. His focus has shifted to something seemingly mundane yet deeply personal. His daughter, Sandra's upcoming wedding. Everyone expects a man of de Vries' stature and wealth to spare no expense for his daughter's big day. But everyone is dead wrong. In an unexpected move, he decides that his chapter members should foot the bill. And it's going to cost them more than a few bucks each. Sandra's wedding dress alone is a lavish affair, costing over $4,000. De Vries becomes a wealthy biker dad, too stingy to pay for his own daughter's wedding, passing the hat around among his juniors. This miserly act doesn't win him any popularity contests in his chapter either. If anything, it only adds to the growing resentment within the ranks, and someone in the club has had enough of de Vries's antics. Peter Schumann's approaches Willem van Boxtel, the big boss of the Hells Angels Amsterdam chapter, with a bold request, permission to take out de Vries. After all, de Vries isn't just a thorn in their side, he is dragging the entire club's name through the mud. Meanwhile, the police, always one step behind de Vries, catch a break. They intercept a phone call where de Vries mentions a meeting at a sushi bar, something about a 100% important discussion. But it isn't an average dinner chat. De Vries is planning a purge of his own chapter, suspecting a betrayal brewing among his followers. So fast forward to the evening of February 11, 2004, De Vries tells his girlfriend he's off to a quick chapter president meeting and will be back in less than 30 minutes. He heads to the meeting at a former brothel just outside Oyersbeek, and here's where things take a dark turn. Around 9 p.m., a witness driving past the clubhouse sees something straight out of a Hollywood action scene. De Vries comes flying out of a second floor window, landing hurt but alive. Then, in a chilling moment, other Hell's Angels, together with Schumann's, drag him back inside. And it becomes a scene of betrayal and retribution. De Vries, his henchmen, and his soon-to-be son-in-law are lined up against a wall and executed by their own biker brothers. Each victim receives three shots, a bullet through their chest, right arm, and head. The bodies are then placed in a rented van and buried in shallow graves near the Juliana Canal, close to a popular footpath. 
This gruesome act isn't just a message to the inner circle, it is a signal to the Colombians and the outside world. The Hells Angels show that they don't hesitate to deal with their own, especially those who defy the club's rules. The killers then strip the clubhouse, give it a thorough cleaning, and slap on new coats of plaster and paint. And in a nod to the Mafia's code of silence, they hang a huge sign reading Omerta. Two days later, on February 13, 2004, the three bodies are discovered, and it's a gruesome end to a turbulent chapter in biker history. De Vries, ever the man of mystery, had a secret love house shared with his girlfriend, a hideout for money and jewelry. His girlfriend, having found out about his death, finds the house looted on February 13th. The killers must have extracted the location from De Vries before his demise. De Vries' funeral is an extravagant affair, attended by Hell's Angels from across the globe. His tombstone, adorned with the SS lightning bolt runes, serves as a dark reminder of his deeds. But among the remaining members of the chapter, there is a sense of relief. At last, the tyrant is gone. And he goes out with a dramatic and almost cinematic ending. From a humble beginning in the Netherlands to a feared figure in the biker world, his life is a roller coaster of power, betrayal, and ultimately, a fall from grace. And his story, as dark and complex as it is, brings out the thin line between loyalty and treachery, between living on the edge and falling off it. He had risen too high, and he was only going to fall harder.